The last meeting of the forum was in January, and the theme on that day was delivery of TBOOC through shared space. And the event was an opportunity to hear about the work uh, ongoing across each headline under the TBOOC strategy in relation in particular to the key priority, our shared space. And the theme for today's event is another key priority, our safe community. It's aim to create a community where everyone feels safe and moving around and where life choices are not inhibited by fears around safety. And that's a fundamental theme of TBOC at any time, but I think it resonates even more against the backdrop of the recent violence and the ongoing political and community tensions. And the efforts of all of those who are involved in TBOC have never been more important. So I'd like to add my personal thanks this morning to those who've been involved in tackling the violence at the flashpoints and the interfaces and diverting young people uh, away from it. The media are always very quick to report the trouble. They're much less interested in those who take the time and take personal risks and make personal sacrifice in order to prevent or minimize the difficulties there. And you all deserve our appreciation for that. Now we're shortly going to hear a number of presentations which will highlight the work and demonstrate what has been achieved under TBOC so far. But before we do that, I'd like to just give you a brief update on what's been happening across the board in relation to the various TBOC headline actions. The Department for Communities has continued to make really good progress with its shared housing program. The department is now supporting 45 schemes comprising 1,480 units. That's a really significant and impressive achievement and vastly exceeds the initial target that was set in the TBOC strategy. And it shows that there is an appetite for shared housing and encourages us all to continue our work together to build upon that success. In Ardoin and Ballysillan, uh, TBOC ambassadors co-designed and delivered their own good relations project with the aim of helping to create the next generation of community leaders. And a similar project entitled Uniting Derg was completed, which engaged young people in a range of sport and creative and good relations activities. And those projects show what can be achieved by empowered and supported communities and the importance of co-design and co-delivery. Meanwhile, across in the Department of Education, work is progressing very well on the first four projects under the Shared Education Compass project. So that's a landmark development, and it's a fundamental change in the way that young people experience education. And alongside shared housing, I think has a huge potential to make a difference and deliver the TBUC aims. In our own department in the executive office, the TBUC camps program has uh, successfully delivered 75 camps in 2021, and that's despite uh, the impact of COVID. And that program seeks to engage uh, young people who are at risk to reduce antisocial behavior, reduce inter and intra community tensions, and divert young people away from risk-taking behaviors. And that's a great example of what we can do quickly reacting to emerging issues and putting in place the delivery needed to take at-risk young people away from disorder. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody in the Education Authority for all of their work and supporting groups to deliver both the camps and the plan interventions program. Uh, in particular, their response and their ability to use alternative methods of engaging with young people during the pandemic. The Good Relations Ambassadors Programme was also delivered through the TBUC Camps Programme in 2021. And the ambassadors are involved in various aspects of the delivery of the Camps Programme and they've all received Good Relations training. And their role includes engaging, encouraging and inspiring other young people to make positive changes in their own lives and to inspire others in their community. Uh, and I applaud the work that they've done. Meanwhile, also in TEO, our Racial Equality Unit is working with the Department of Education to identify ways to tackle racist bullying in schools and also with the Department of Justice to develop an approach to tackling race hate crime. And this work will result in making the community safer for newcomers who have made Northern Ireland their home. Also in TEO, the Urban Villages Initiative continues to work collaboratively with partners across a range of departments, district councils, arm's length bodies, and most importantly, communities themselves. And that works to build capacity, improve the physical environment, and create thriving places and safe communities. And £18.5 million pounds of capital investment has been spent across the five urban village areas. And that's transformed the infrastructure available to local residents. 
to give just one good example, the Grace Family Centre, which just opened last week, is an excellent example. Taking a previously derelict building at the Ardoin interface in North Belfast and providing a safe space for women to access training, advice and educational programmes. The Department of Justice's removal of interface programme continues to make progress at a number of interface barriers. And we're going to hear more about that uh, in, in a few moments. Those are just a few highlights. Uh, I could give very many more of a really successful, thriving strategy. So moving straight into that, then we'll turn to the first of the presentations. I'll invite Michael McAvoy from the uh, Department of Justice uh, to talk to us about the interface programme. I'm Michael McAvoy. I'm a public servant. I joined the Department of Justice a few years ago now to head up the interfaces team within DOJ. And I suppose it's worth saying that the job I have in DOJ involves leading a small team of staff who manage the department's physical interface barriers across Northern Ireland that is sometimes referred to as peace walls. We seek to reduce or remove them where there's an appetite to do so. The other parts of my job involves sponsoring the 11 policing and community safety partnerships that operate across Northern Ireland and some work connected to the executives tackling paramilitism program. And they're disparate areas of work uh, but the common theme is that they all involve finding local solutions to local problems uh, by working with local people. Uh, and from most of my career in a number of departments now, I mean, my work has revolved around community-based economic development, tackling deprivation or community and political liaison, dealing with issues such as parades uh, and the legacy of Northern Ireland's uh, troubles. Uh, work on interfaces clearly touches on just about all of those issues. John F. Kennedy once said, every accomplishment starts with the decision to try, and that quotation applied to interfaces may best sum up the Northern Ireland executive decision in 2013 uh, to seek to remove all interface barriers in Northern Ireland uh, by 2023. And no one said it would be easy. Um, time is running out, um, if you regard that as a target as opposed to an aspiration. But taken Alongside uh, all the other headline actions in the Together Building a United Community or TBUC strategy around shared education, shared housing, urban villages, United Youth programs, shared TBUC camps and community sports. Clearly, the executive made a strong commitment to improving community relations um, and continuing the journey towards more united and, and shared society. Chris provided a short update on progress against the other six headline actions in his opening remarks. The Department of Justice has a lead role on the seventh headline action working to reduce and remove interfaces in Northern Ireland. That's not, however, to say that our input is the main or the most important role, far from it. It just means that we have a lead role in talking to everyone and anyone who may be involved in a decision to reduce or remove an interface. But we tend to operate on a make progress where we can basis, uh, but we'll work with all interface communities uh, whether they're starting the conversation or uh, at the point where they'd like to see physical change happen. And when agreement is reached, we sometimes have the practical and very pleasant task uh, of barrier removal. Like most government departments the world over, I suspect, so we don't always get everything right all the time, but we work in good faith and um, with all willing partners. And, and my invitation from TEO and CRC colleagues to say a few words this morning came with a number of asks. I was told that there would be some attendees in the audience who may not know a lot about the background to or even the extent of the interface structures or peace walls across Northern Ireland. Uh, so I was asked to explain what they are, where they are, and, and how the Department of Justice goes about helping to uh, bring about the removal. I was also uh, encouraged to seek a bit of therapy from the audience. Uh, by that, I said that the CRC meant that I should share with you some of the obstacles and challenges that the department faces in our endeavours. And I know just from having a quick scan across the multiple screens this morning at the start of the, the, the call, that there, there are dozens of time served good relations practitioners from both the community based and statutory sector tuned in to this morning's session. So your thoughts, comments, observations, um, or constructive criticisms slash helpful suggestions um, during the Q&A session will be, will be most welcome. I'll come to the obstacles and challenges shortly, but in terms of what interfaces are and where they are, uh, 2019 marked 50 years since the first interface structure peace line was erected in Northern Ireland. It went up in Belfast in the form of a makeshift barrier with rows of barbed wire. They were put up to separate communities as a security measure to preserve peace and maintain order at a time when people were being killed as a result of inter-community tension and violence. 
Now, 52 years later, that same interface is part of a long wall with stanchions, fencing and mesh on top, stretching along a line dividing two districts, one predominantly Protestant and one predominantly Catholic in West Belfast. Um, even though we don't look it, uh, I'm the same age as the first Peace War in Northern Ireland. Um, when my mother um, uh, had me, she uh, tells me now that she, she commented to people locally that um, at least I wouldn't know anything of the troubles that, that uh, had just started in 69. But um, I, I don't imagine that she ever thought that the peace lines that were going up then would still be in place 25 years after much of the violence had ended. Um, back in 2010, when the placing and justice functions were transferred to the Department of Justice, we were given responsibility for 59 such structures. The department uses justice and, sec and security powers to requisition land, construct, maintain, and retain such structures for the continuing preservation of peace and the maintenance of order. It's important to mention the legislative underpinning for interfaces um, that are the responsibility of the Department of Justice because it explains why the ones we have differ from those owned by other organizations such as the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. They vary in size, scale and construction um, from a million brick wall to a fence with a pedestrian access gate in it between the gables of two houses. We own the Lanarkway gates, that featured so heavily in worldwide coverage uh, of the recent trouble in Belfast. Uh, and from the 59 interface structures we inherited in 2010, 16 of them have been removed, 43 remain, and quite a number of the remaining structures have been reduced in one way or another. Um, in the case of gates, sometimes that simply involves um, making sure that they open longer each day now than they once did. The housing executive owned a further 21 structures back in 2010, of which 13 remain. Um, across both executive and themselves, they're, they're mostly in Belfast. They're in the north, west, and east of the city, uh, and in Derry, Londonderry, and Port of Town. And until recently, we had one in Lurgan, but it was removed earlier this year. Uh, DJ talks about having 59 interfaces and, and says that they've been reduced to 43. Belfast Interface Project, who are presenting next, say that there are 116 different interface uh, security barriers across Northern Ireland. Uh, two possible explanations for the discrepancy. Um, TOJ is spinning the numbers or Belfast Interface Project is simply wrong. Uh, I was genuinely confused myself about the difference when I joined DOJ. And the simple truth is that DOJ tends to cluster its interfaces in certain areas, such as Duncan Gardens, where, uh, whereas BIP counts them separately. Um, we believe we have a continuous peace line in Duncan Gardens with different structures. BIP counts them as six separate interfaces. I suppose we really should try and get some common language around this, but probably having philosophical debates is, is I'd suggest, less important than trying to make progress on interface reduction and removal. When thinking about some of the obstacles and challenges that CRC asked me to reflect on, I actually started thinking more about what I believe are popular misconceptions about our work rather than real problems. We sometimes get criticised for not having a strategy and work programme for taking down interfaces, or, or it suggested that we don't have the budget. In terms of strategy, the t uh, strategy in 2013 created a clear aspiration. It is to remove or reduce all interfaces by 2023. Um, that's as clear a mission statement as you can get. Uh, in 2019, we also published the more detailed interfaces program framework document, which sets out the principles that underpin our work and the methodology we use. In terms of a work program, we have one of those as well. Uh, but if interface reduction and removal is going to be based on working in partnership with local communities, then a lot of the time, um, our, a lot of the time, our plans are, are going to be strongly influenced um, by the pace at which those communities are happy to work. The bullet points on screen is simply sum up uh, how we go about our work in partnership with others. In terms of money to achieve interface reduction or removal, 60 million was available for the five year period from April 2016 to March 2021 from the Treasury to, amongst other things, assist interface removal work and help create a shared future. That was, of course, across the entirety of the TBUC um, strategy. DOJ bids for resources um, based on anticipated spend for interface reduction and removal work uh, on an annual um, forward look basis. Uh, in my experience, genuinely over recent years, uh, it's been the availability of, a, of uh, a viable interface reduction and removal projects that has been the issue more than the availability of resources. Uh, I also hear, often hear that in trying to remove interface buyers, we should uh, focus on easy wins to build momentum. From experience, I'm not so sure there are too many easy wins in this line of work. When dealing with an interface uh, structure in West Belfast a couple of years ago, we were talking about a wall that wasn't even an interface, strictly speaking, was in a single identity community. 
um, because of demographic changes. And, and it, to no sectarian dimension in terms of inter-community violence in close proximity to that uh, interface wall, uh, or even a resident population from the perceived other community. But notwithstanding, we apply community consultation and consent principles, uh, and it still took us twice as long and required us to spend uh, twice as much to remove what was seemingly an innocuous hangover from a, a very different security era. So as it turned out, not such an easy win. But, but that said, I'm, I'm happy that with a few lessons learned along the way, it was the right process over the necessary time scale to deliver good results. One of the key things I've learned from my work in DOJ over the years is that uh, every interface is unique. I say this so often. Most of the time, you're dealing with a unique community of interest, a unique backstory to the reason why that interface went up there in the first place and you require a bespoke solution to barrier reduction or removal. Uh, from a DOJ perspective, we're perfectly happy to work on that basis, and perhaps in support of the suggestion that we should devote some of our efforts uh, around early wins. I can think of four DOJ interface structures that are on or near a private developer's site. Planning permission, a digger, uh, a lorry load of bricks, and uh, would, would render those uh, interface structures obsolete um, and clearly it would also offer the potential for community benefit in terms of investment and physical regeneration but as I mentioned they're all private uh, development sites and um, so the time scale for, for that we're not entirely in control of. TPAC acknowledges and we fully understand that, that those most affected by any decision to reduce or remove an interface are usually those living closest proximity to that interface that seems a very obvious statement Securing community consent for change informs everything we do. It's a key principle that underpins our work. Um, securing community consent is, admittedly, it's not easy. Um, we've been challenged by leading academics, such as Dr. Johnny Byrne from Ulster University, to define what constitutes community consent when removing or reducing an interface structure. Uh, from my experience, this is where it gets complicated. Sometimes people tell us that 50% of the local population plus one in favour of change is good enough. Um, and that constitutes consent. And on other occasions, everyone defends the right of one local resident to say no, um, whatever about the overwhelming view locally. So coming up with a formula to make such calls is going to be problematic, and it cuts across the idea that every interface is unique and every solution is down to local people. In some areas, we've been told that it's nothing to do with local business owners, workers, or parishioners, because they don't live there. In other areas, people are happy um, to factor in the views of a wide community of interest. But there's no easy answer, but what I do know from working with International Fund for Ireland groups, amongst others, is that we're getting a sense of where the answer may lie. We'll continue to learn lessons and use those to inform how we respond to the issue of community consent going forward. In short, it's about securing as much community consensus as possible and then working to see how we can respond to any concerns that is, uh, may have been raised and or ameliorate, ameliorate any risks uh, identified. As with lots of good relations work, obtaining community consent is clearly more of a process than an event. I'd also contend that being able to point to real life examples is pro probably a better way to proceed with debating the theory of consent. As a public servant, I hear often about a lack of coordination across government, sometimes described as a lack of joined up government. Uh, and on that front, when it comes to interface reduction or removal work, I, I genuinely believe that cross departmental and interagency cooperation uh, continues to improve. The department accepts that, that interface reduction and removal shouldn't happen in isolation. Uh, substantial change will depend on measurable changes to local well-being, including economic, social, security, education, and environmental benefits. But the sum total of the work done in interface areas to achieve these goals is, is genuinely enormous. Uh, TBUC is but one government strategy and funding stream. Neighbourhood Renewal, Good Relations, Local Investment Fund, Early Intervention Transformation Programme, Social Investment Fund, Education Zones and Tackling Paramilitarism um, are just a, a number of the further uh, programmes um, that, that exist that often provide resources into interface committees. Um, DOJ sometimes gets accused of having too much of a focus on barrier reduction or removal without considering the other needs of a local community around the bigger regeneration picture. Um, but I would have to say that knowing what is going on in an area in terms of planned, physical, economic, social and community regeneration is actually our starting point um, for any conversation. You can genuinely spend days um, mapping all of the interventions that exist. And maybe that's an issue in itself. But as we live in Northern Ireland and not North Korea, central control uh, of everything is, is, uh, that is going on is it's not our aim. Um, these are complex problems that require uh, us all to work together if we're going to, to make progress. 
And it's also worth noting that many of these issues exist in areas where there are no interfaces or interface peace walls, structures, uh, or inter-community tensions or trouble. Again, from experience, the only form of coordination or uh, joined up government that works um, is the one that brings all of the right people together locally to address or influence uh, change. Some of the background information I've shared with you and the, the challenges I've had are covered in the framework documents uh, produced by the department that I mentioned earlier, which is, is available uh, online uh, from the DOJ website. But there have been some successes along the way. Um, let me uh, take a bit of time to show you um, what interface reduction and removal uh, can look like in practice, focusing on the story of Duncan Gardens, the Crumlin Road, uh, and Serpentine with Barra uh, in North Belfast. In fact, those are all North Belfast examples. Um, there are others. Um, Duncan Gardens, um, that slide is entitled Interface Creations. So there's a wee bit of History very briefly. In Duncan Gardens in North Belfast has experienced significant physical and demographic changes uh, over the years. I mean, what the Luftwaffe didn't manage to destroy during World War II, intercommunity sectarian violence helped demolish uh, in the 1970s. The bombings of commercial premises, attacks on homes, rioting, uh, and bomb scares. Uh, many of the homes along Duncan Gardens were left derelict uh, by the mid 1970s. But aerial photograph uh, of uh, the gardens. So it's I mean, Duncan Gardens, it's an old Belfast tree lined uh, avenue uh, with a lot of history. But for the, the past 30 plus years, it's also been a pretty hard edged dividing line uh, between the local uh, Catholic Masonist Republican community uh, and the New Lodge and the Protestant Unionist Loyalist community of Tigers Bay. Both sides of Duncan Gardens contain a series of interface fences, walls, gates, decorative boundary walls, and bricked up streets. Um, for DOJ, interface structure counting purposes, as I mentioned earlier, a total of six uh, structures make up what we refer to as the Duncairn South interface. Uh, on the, that's just on the New Lodge side of Duncairn Gardens. Uh, a policy response to sectarian interface violence that didn't involve erecting walls like Cooper Way that exists in West Belfast, it was piloted by a uh, government along Duncan Gardens in the 1980s and uh, early 1990s through the provision of community owned social economy workspace and the development of an advanced uh, factory by Invest NI. Land was used to create a buffer uh, or neutral zone between the two communities. After a number of difficult early years, the business centre depicted, um, uh, which is there for local uh, employment and uh, business incubation purposes. Um, it's now fully let uh, and, and thriving. The commercial development that I just showed you um, certainly helped remove a significant tract of dereliction that existed uh, at that sort of interface across uh, the wasteland, but, but it didn't remove the interface since entirely. I mean, the images uh, on screen show a range of remaining interface structures that stretch out along Duncan Gardens, bricked up streets with pedestrian gates that open on a daily basis uh, and pedestrian access points wedged between a, a church uh, and local housing again going on a daily basis. Hopefully, you can see that that's 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 one uh, of the uh, interface structures that existed along Duncan Gardens. And uh, what you're looking at is is a seventy meter long, seven meter high interface fence uh, erected in, in the early nineteen seventies. The aerial photograph in the bottom uh, probably gives you a sense of the scale um, uh, of that interface at what we would describe as Hellman Court. On one side of the fence, um, the fence itself overshadowed homes, and on the other side, uh, it sat um, behind uh, a development site in private ownership. In terms of the, the work we do on interface removal, I mean, the DOJ was able to work at this location with the IFI funded Duncan Community Partnership, um, a local cross community partnership, um, to develop a proposal uh, which was essentially to remove the structure, the, the ugly green fence, um, and replace it with a much lower boundary wall. Um, with concerns remaining about security at this location, and uh, we also agreed to erect a temporary missile stop fence separate to, uh, but in front of the wall. Um, and looking for community benefit um, is, is part of what we endeavour to do on any uh, interface reduction or removal scheme. At this location, the removal of what was a very overbearing solid structure um, created an opportunity uh, for the extension of local gardens at the home, as you can see. Um, and an overall improvement in the visual immunity uh, of the area uh, proved possible. It's it's an improvement, but it's still a wall. Um, um, but I say that there's there's genuinely considerable community benefit in terms of not people not living in the shadow uh, of that uh, interface. And that development site in front of the wall 
when it's fully developed out, um, our expectation is that that, that uh, will have been future proofed in as much as that temporary fence can come down. The boundary wall will continue to exist as a boundary perimeter at the end of the, the street. The development site will be developed out, restoring the frontage of Duncan Gardens. And um, so the temporary fence will come away, and that um, uh, interface will, will be rendered obsolete. Uh, that's that's our object. I think maybe one further one, which maybe just shows the before and after. Um, you have to kind of look at that because the uh, before is on the right hand side with the rubbish and the uh, weeds and the fence. Um, I have to get a better photograph than that of the after or a better angle, but I thought just that, I'd use that sort of it's kind of taken from the same angle. But we have a clear development site, uh, a wall, um, creating some um, uh, light uh, for those local homes, the extension of gardens, and um, uh, a general improvement in the, the visual amenity of that area through, uh, through that, that particular project. I say we don't often expect so many Berlin Wall moments in this uh, line of work, um, but clearly uh, people have benefited um, from uh, the, the scheme that we might see develop along um, Duncan Gardens at Duncan Holland Court. That, that's, a, that's a before shot, um, that's a, an interface wall. This is a, a, an interface removal project. Uh, uh, housing executive on part of that structure, DOJ owns the top half, and, and that, that interface fence was erected a number of years ago to prevent missiles. Uh, being directed towards those homes along North Queen Street, which there are 10 houses um, in you know, the, the New Lodge area on North Queen Street. Um, so that, that's what it looked like until quite recently. And the next slide will show you some work in progress. Um, the fence has been removed in its entirety. We have an environment improvement scheme, which is under construction. Um, uh, now, you can, see, you can get a sense on the photograph on the left of the scale of, of room and ground that is created and release the freed up once you take away those sort of overbearing security structures uh, and say that the scheme will continue through to the summer. Um, but, but other people may also recognize that street as one where interface uh, community violence, um, or interface violence, we should say, happened uh, as part of the recent trouble. They were literally um, throwing missiles uh, at police at the junction of Dunkirk Gardens and Graham Street at that location. Um, which is it's just it's a setback and it's so disappointing because it took a number of years again with non current community partnership working with local people um, to, to get them across a line in terms of them having the confidence to recognize that um, things had changed things had moved on and the potential for their homes to be damaged um, was significantly reduced um, compared to the trouble that had been at that location uh, in the past so, but, but again as Chris alluded to it, it was it started it stopped relatively quickly and a lot of people worked locally um, to bring about uh, an end to that um, spike in, in interface violence that, that occurred. That's a scheme that was done a number of years ago again, primarily by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive on the Common Road. A lot of people drive up and down the Common Road. Um, it was a 10-foot brown brick wall in front of those houses at Brompton Park. Um, uh, and local people, uh, uh, after some discussions over a number of years, were content to see that removed. Um, and replaced with um, railings and some environmental improvements um, to release for the first time in a number of years uh, a view across to a uh, lovely church across the common road. Um, so I say that's that's the, the type of scheme uh, that we've managed to um, work on and deliver in partnership with local people. We looked at, at, a, at a large fence on Serpentine Road, uh, which was a security fence between uh, effectively dividing two communities uh, at a point along the Serpentine Road where there historically had been quite a lot of interface uh, violence. Uh, a couple of pics on the right-hand side show you that there was some work done to remove that um, structure. And the next slide um, will let you see what it is now. Um, the aerial photograph on the right is really helpful because you're looking at that. The fence was along this top left-hand corner of that. Uh, and you can see on the top left-hand photograph um, how that fence has been replaced with, it's a multi-use games area, it's a play park. There was a community centre there, and there always was access, but you kind of had to go through the interface fence uh, to get to the other side. So with that being removed, it's just freed up some land where we've created a, a more open and friendly uh, access, creating passive surveillance um, and shared community facilities in the form of a play park, a multi use games area, as I say, access to community facilities on one side um, and access um, out onto Serpentine Road uh, to local shops on the other. Again, um, we, we talked about challenges throughout this, so um, if you just may flick through to that sort of, there's a couple of, yeah, 
Okay, you just skip on, but listen, let, let's, let me just, because I think I've been speaking uh, for long enough, let me just uh, endeavor to sort of draw things uh, to a close. But uh, again, you saw a photograph of a rat and um, events can sometimes get in the way uh, of the undoubted momentum that has been created towards interface reduction and removal. Um, panel reports to controller committees and gatekeepers who purport to speak for committees is a feature of the work that we do. The flags protest in 2012, parade related protests in 2013 that extended through to 2016, had a damaging effect on cross community relations across Belfast in particular. As Chris mentioned at the start, uh, a number of recent setbacks, but from my perspective, uh, there's still an overwhelming desire for positive change. It is genuinely uh, a work in progress. Um, in terms of the work DOJ seeks to progress in interface areas, we sometimes start with our structures, but we always know that it's actually about people's lives. It's about life in an interface community and about the possibilities for change. It's about young people growing up in areas that are separated by physical barriers. And it's about acknowledging that those barriers were put there to protect life limb uh, at a time, but asking a question about the purpose they serve now. Um, I'm convinced that there is an appetite for change that is reflected in research conducted by the department, um, by Ulster University, um, and by the International Fund for Ireland. So from DOJ's perspective, we will work with interface communities to reduce and remove interface structures to overcome the inevitable obstacles that occur to find the resources needed to achieve the ambitions of local interface communities and, and to help deliver the change that the people living within interface communities want to see. As Chris noted at the outset, the interface program um, exists to work towards the aspirations set out in the T-Buck strategy around our safe community. Um, and as interface communities succeed in reducing, removing, re-imaging, sometimes reclassifying or reconfiguring um, interface structures, uh, it's at least five hours, um, there's no doubt that they will indeed create a community where everyone feels safe and moving around and where life choices are not inhibited. Um, by fears around safety, uh, as outlined in the T-Box strategy. That's our ultimate shared goal and as a public servant. It's a pleasure to uh, work with local people to achieve that aim. One of the things that Michael emphasised there, I think quite rightly, was that successful solutions and successful delivery don't come solely top-down from, from government. They depend on, on partnership across government and uh, with local councils and, and lots of other organisations. And above all, they depend on empowering and equipping local communities uh, to, to shape their own future. And we're going to hear a little bit more, I think, on, on that theme now in the second presentation from the Belfast Interface Project. Uh, Paul Smith and Professor Peter Bloom are going to present on the Shared Futures Community Planning Toolkit. My name is Paul Smith, and I am the Project Coordinator at Belfast Interface Project. I'm also the lead on this project here in Belfast. Shared Futures is the culmination of many years work and research carried out by Belfast Interface Project, working with interface communities across Belfast, and recently with community groups in Tully Alley and Curran Ewan in Derry, London Derry. Throughout BIP's research, the main sticking point has always been the question around the removal of peach walls and barriers. When asked the question, would you like to see the walls come down, most people will climb up and refuse to discuss the subject. And as I'm sure you're aware, since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the number and size of security barriers has increased without a recognised plan of action for the removal. The most recent survey asked the question quite succinctly. It asked, would you like to see the walls come down? Respondents were asked to tick whichever box represented their answer. The answers were a simple yes or no. Belfast Interface Project has rephrased this question, and we now ask, would you like to see the walls come down? or would you like an alternative? We believe this project gives interface communities the opportunity to explore alternatives. We have been working on this project for almost three years now. During this period, we have engaged with numerous youth and community groups across the city. They have been to the forefront in the design and development of the community toolkit, which, incident, which incidentally uh, was launched recently and is available for download on Google Store in either Android or Apple format. The idea for this new and innovative project came about in 2019 when Belfast Interface Project Strategic Director Joel Donnell and Professor Peter Bloom of Essex University came together to discuss the possible uses of augmented reality as a tool for community groups to communicate, cooperate and collaborate in a safe environment. The idea was to offer local communities the tools to help them envisage 
the future building possibilities for their area. While seeking in the short term to remove barriers in people's minds, our long-term goal was to remove the physical and social barriers dividing interface communities. Our community toolkit is made up of three component parts. Firstly, we have the consultant pool or website. Secondly, we have what is known as the local internet network. And thirdly, an augmented reality app. Was that because basically this is where the technical stuff starts, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Bloom. He will explain the intricacies of the toolkit in a little more detail. So what is shared futures? Well, in a word or a sentence, it's a first of its kind, never been done before, community democracy and future planning toolkit. It works to give communities who often don't have a voice the ability to work together to create their own shared futures. At its heart, even though this is very innovative, and as Paul said, I'll be speaking a lot about the technology part, but at its heart, this is about creating something that is community-led and people-driven. So all of this has been designed in consultation and co-developed with interface community members and leaders. So before I start, I thought I could share just a very short video that we developed with some interface community members, particularly young people in North Belfast, that kind of present um, the ethos of our project, if you will. This is our city today. What would you like to see here tomorrow? Sketch your ideas. I'm sure with your friends. Remix ideas together. And see them happen. And play at app. That's just a little glimpse at our toolkit. As Paul said, it has three component parts. Right? The first is a local interface network, what we call our explore tool. And as we'll see uh, more in a bit, this is a Wi-Fi network that was created with community leaders in interface areas that allow them to actually have a tool for cross-community collaboration. We've also created a public online consultation tool. Right now, it's currently located in Limestone uh, Road, Alexander Park in North Belfast. And this is a really innovative tool that allows community members to actually propose new ideas and collaborate to improve them together for shared areas in their communities. And finally, we have a visualized tool, our mobile augmented reality app. Before we go on, I wanna just again, thank our team, which is our Belfast Interface Project um, and the Strategic Director, Joe O'Donnell. Um, the University of Essex, which I'm part of, and the innovation team I lead, which includes the Anamorph London Tech Cooperative and independent researchers like George Alon. I also really want to take a moment to support our funders. We've been generously supported in all ways by the Executive Office, by the Belfast City Council, and by the Community Relations Council. So I really want to take a moment because they've, they've really understood what we've been trying to do, and they've been so generous in their support and we really appreciate it. So where did this idea come from? Well, what we always wanted was something that was community-led, that was people-driven. And in a sense, we wanted to combine ideas of community democracy, real empowering future building, and the creation of different types of shared spaces, not just physical shared spaces, but virtual shared spaces like you might have on a mobile app, or digital shared spaces like you might have on a website. So we wanted to create various ways for people to interact, collaborate, and build their short and long-term futures together. Our aims were to discover how to build peace through cross-community cooperation and shared development, to understand the challenges faced by interface communities in breaking down physical, social, and psychological walls, to highlight the potential for bringing together innovative development perspectives with peace-building efforts within interface communities, and to explore the role that the Shared Futures Toolkit could have for promoting a common recovery within interface areas, not just for building a shared future, but also for helping to overcome present crises like we've seen with COVID-19. Our core principles from the beginning have always been combining communication, consultation, and cooperation. And the community has told us that what they really want is a greater ability to participate, to learn about new types of innovative approaches, 
and to see them being realized. How was it developed? Well, over the last two and a half years, we've done 60 hours of interviews and focus groups with community members, leaders from interface areas, and a broad range of voices. This includes public experts and policymakers, VCSE members engaged in interesting community wealth building projects, youth leaders from interface areas, community leaders from interface areas, and young people from interface areas. Again, these are just some of the interface communities that we've worked with, but we've done it across Belfast. We've also worked with some really interesting innovators, including the new Belfast Tool Library, the Participatory Budgeting Works, and Development Trust Northern Ireland. We started in 2019, and over the first year in East and West Belfast, so in Inner East and Short Strand and Divis and Townsend, we created a mobile augmented reality app. This year, we worked with uh, community members in North Belfast and created an online proposed tool. We've also worked with Belfast leaders um, across the city and created our local interface network. So let's look at these in a bit more detail, if it's all right. The first is our local interface network. Hello, everyone. This is the Shared Futures Local Interface Network. So what is the Local Interface Network? Before we show you the user interface of this tool, let's first discuss its scale and potential uses. Essentially, it is a small electrical device, 2.5 inches in length. It's a handy scale and can be powered by an external battery for use whilst being on the go. This device produces a local closed Wi-Fi network. This Wi-Fi signal can be accessed at a youth centre, in the park, on a bus trip, or even in a gym or a hall. So it's really handy. The device essentially provides a portable server. This server is accessible by a smartphone, tablet, PC, or a laptop. They can all gain access to the content found on the device. The content on this portable server is especially designed for the youth and their youth leaders to help support them in their activities. These tools consist of a digital library, discussion forums, polls, surveys, and shared future activities, also collaborations and documents, creative tools, interactive content, event posting, and even more. So, as I said, this is a Raspberry Pi local and portable Wi-Fi network that contains a range of original and innovative resources promoting shared futures building and collaboration among community members. It's currently right now in 10 youth centers and interface areas across Belfast. So we've actually created an entire collaborative website that they can use for cross-community collaboration. But as you can see, um, it has a video game that we created that allows them to experience a day in a life in 2035 in a community without walls based on sustainability and cooperation. It has a participatory budgeting game that allows them either in person or via Zoom to actually plan uh, for empowering futures in their area in a time span of five, 10 or 15 years. And it also has interactive maps um, that people can use, that they can explore all the peace walls in Northern Ireland with discussion forums, as well as all the kind of really interesting community innov innovations that are happening as well with uh, discussion forums. So this is a little bit of our participatory budget game. This is our video game that we created. Um, here's an example of the 3D map that we created. Um, and then it also has abilities for file sharing, polls and surveys, and shared writing tools. We also created a proposed tool, and this is a web-based platform that invites people to propose, remix, and vote on ideas for improving areas in their community. And we allow for the popular ideas, hopefully, as we develop this more, to be selected and be included on the mobile app. As you can see, it's available online, so anyone can use it. Find your area and click here on post your ideas for your area. This is my neighborhood and I can see a spot I walk past all the time. Vacant land at Limestone Road interface. That's the one. Here's an idea someone has already posted. It's grand. I'm going to give it a like. 
I like where this is going with the wildlife idea. What else, though? Hmm. I'd like to be able to have a rest on my walk. And a chill out by a wee pond. A couple of park chairs to put my feet up. And some koi carp swimming in there too. Right, all done. I hit post. So just to give you an example of the different things you can do. So last night in North Belfast, um, in the Lansdowne Road area with the Star Youth Group, we created GIFs of the different proposals that the young people had made, and we taught them how to make GIFs. So for instance, these are all actual proposals made by young people, and you can see how they vote on each other's proposal. And they can share these GIFs, or they can share links outside of the tool as well. We're also uh, in the process of working with a local digital artist who's going to be able to actually help them turn their ideas for a football pitch using a proposed tool into an actual funding visual plan. The final part of the toolkit is our visualize tool. And this is a cross-platform augmented reality app that invites people to visualize developments to see how their surroundings could change. It allows them to discuss ideas to further shape them and take them to fruition. And also the comments from the app are included in real time right on the website. So I won't show you the whole video, but I'll show you just a little piece of what it looks like. So it's free. Anyone can download it. No problem. Okay. So when you go, it just takes you through how to use it. Very simple. At the moment, two choices of two different maps. I will go for the Divis and Town. Okay. So this is Divis and Town's End. So as you can see, it appears as a present map first. And on that present map, you can make comments to various parts. Okay. And then we've also developed a uh, vision of the future um, with local community members. Okay. So this is a future of what it could look like without walls. And again, people can make comments and give their own ideas. And you can download this for free and put this on any space. So it's a really interesting and innovative visualizing tool. So what's next? Well, we've gotten feedback initially from over 40 interface community members. 80% have said they had a strongly positive experience and 98% said they had a positive experience. We've had a, seen a 13% improvement in attitudes toward cross community good relations and collaborations just in the making of this toolkit. Some really innovative quotes that I think are indicative when it said that the toolkit allows and provides the need for young people to be involved in this process and empowered to make real change driven by new thinking and remove old historic barriers to progress. It also enables people to envision a different future for themselves, their families and communities. And it will connect people to their politicians and allow community engagement in a way never tried before. We've come up with ideas for uh, engaging with community members of all ages. We've also been working with youth and community leaders for this purpose, and we're hoping that this can directly engage with public decision makers. So going forward, we're creating a shared future building uh, program for all youth leaders. We're gonna pilot it uh, in two or three places uh, this autumn, and we hope to spread it across um, Belfast. We're also working on a future potential innovators program for community members across Northern Ireland using the toolkit. We want to expand the toolkit to interface areas across all of Northern Ireland. And we want to enhance the toolkit by allowing people to actually create their own augmented reality apps where they get to decide what this place would look like without the walls and they can remap their futures together. So I just want to end with two video testimonials. One is from Brian Kasky from Limestone United in North Belfast. Hello everyone, it's Brian from Limestone United. It's just great to be able to talk about the Shared Futures Toolkit on the great, innovative, fun way it has enabled us to engage with our young people and our community to try and make positive change in our area. In particular, it's great to be supported by the LIN network. And it's something that we're using as we try uh, to progress an innovative idea that we have of creating uh, a multi-surface pitch right in the line to node interface. And it's something which is toolkit has been great to allow us to explore ideas and speak to our young people and see what would benefit not only them, 
of the whole community. Something really, really great to be involved. We're really excited about the potential outcomes and how many people will get involved um, and engage in a way that is new and will enable everybody to get involved and progress their ideas and hopefully we can turn it into reality. So thank you everyone. Bye. And just finally, also from Billie Jean Bradfall from Lagan Village in Inner East, um, in East Belfast, who's really been, both have helped us in terms of developing this. Hi, yes. my name is Billie Jean, and I'm a youth worker for Lagan Village Youth and Community Group. We're so excited to be one of the very first users of the local interface network. This will enable us to co-create positive changes together. We're an we sit in an interface area along with the short strand, and this makes the use of the local interface network even more important for us. The local interface network encourages cross-community future planning with the hopes that one day there will be a shared space within the interface network where young people from both sides of the community can meet in a safe and positive environment. Combined with the local interface network, it helps bring the goal closer to reality. This allows us to create programs and store them digitally for the young people to get access a lot easier and makes prog the program aspect of youth work more engaging and more helpful. So therefore, this will encourage the young people to become more engaged. Our young people were part of the testing of the Augmented Reality app, and the feedback from them has been incredible. This will give the young people of our community a sense of ownership within their community and allow them to be part of the future planning of our community. We really believe this is a really strong toolkit that can make a true difference in bringing communities together in an exciting, empowering, and innovative way. Fascinating insight into your approach to challenging or answering that most difficult of questions that, that we all face, which is how do you turn a desire for change into delivering change? And you've shown what can happen when, when you harness two fundamental tools, real, genuine local democracy and, and innovation, and putting those things together in a way that uh, provides the opportunity to move from ideas to reality for communities. That was inspiring and, and very, very encouraging. Thank you. We're now in our third presentation going to hear uh, another dimension of this very important work. And we're going to hear of the work of uh, St. Columns Park House at a particular interface at, at Tulliale, Tullinaran. Uh, and Becca from St. Columns Park is going to describe the work there. For those of you who are not familiar with St. Columns Park House, uh, we are a peace and reconciliation center on the water side in Derry City. Um, and our mission is really to provide sanctuary and support for local residents to become change makers, peacemakers, uh, peace builders, and community leaders as well. And some of the uh, guiding principles that we use are around finding peace within, peace with others, but also peace with nature. Um, and a lot of the programs that we have in St. Combs Park House are revolve around the actual space in the park, uh, connecting with nature, connecting with others, connecting with ourselves. And so uh, recently there's been uh, a beautiful uh, revamping of, of the actual physical space, including uh, the rebuilding of the walled garden um, behind St. Combs Park House. And so if folks haven't had a chance to come down, I really wanna encourage people uh, to visit St. Combs Park House and the Walled Garden, particularly if you get a day like today. But that said, um, we've been working in Tully Alley and Curry Mirren really for the past uh, five years uh, from St. Combs Park House. Um, and we were approached by the committees, uh, the management committees in both Curry Mirren and Tully Alley three years ago, well, four years ago, I suppose, to put in a tender for the Peace Four program in order to do uh, cross-community and uh, shared work there. And um, in some ways, we were hoping to be able to um, build on the existing structures that were there, the committees, the community centers, um, and have additional cross-community work um, to what was um, to programming that already existed. But it was very clear when we began the Peace Four program Common Ground that there were massive gaps uh, and lack of investment in these two areas. So Curry Niren and Tali Ali are on the within the waterside DEA. Um, so within the study, but they are the last two estates before hitting the rural area. Um, and so there's a real sense of um, isolation from the city. There's a sense of lack of investment. Um, both of these areas are within the neighborhood renewal um, area here. Um, however, 
um, you know, with high, high levels of social deprivation, um, lack of uh, community connections in terms of um, sort of uh, accessibility, et cetera. Um, and uh, but both of these areas have not had ongoing sustainable investment and support from local government from council, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things that we really discovered very quickly were that there are massive needs in the area that in some ways um, our program, the Peace Four program, was one of the only um, programs actually delivering uh, uh, programs and services um, in the area at the time. And so there's a real sense from the community of neglect, which I don't think is wrong. I think that those two communities have been neglected. Um, for example, the uh, community center in Curry Mirren um, has no funding from Department for Communities, even though it's within the neighborhood renewal area. The community center itself um, is owned by the community. Um, so it's not that the building is not maintained by anybody and they exist year on year out trying to find small grants in order to turn the lights on, the heat on, um, and, and they haven't had a full-time worker for the entire time that I've been involved um, in, in the area. Um, in Tali Alley, there's a, a similar sense of, uh, ne of neglect and deprivation when they look to neighboring areas and seeing while, whilst they have a lovely um, community center um, for the three years of the Common Ground Project, there was only a community uh, center manager in post for um, less than half the time that I was there, um, lots of vacancies. Um, and there really could, these could be two very thriving areas with ongoing investment, but unfortunately, that has not been the case. And so, when the Peace Project uh, entered the area, and when uh, once we began, began um, providing uh, some of some of the programs that uh, folks wanted in the area, after talking to the two committees, it was very clear um, there was no youth provision, uh, there were no ongoing programs. And what both committees wanted was for this Peace Four program to fill in some of those gaps. And so the first thing we did immediately um, in St. Holmes Park, actually in partnership with Belfast Interface Project, was to begin to look for um, that youth provision that was so desperately needed. And so uh, Common Ground Peace Project became um, both a delivering pro uh, <laughs> cross-community programming uh, project but also a strategic project in trying to figure out how to advocate for these areas, how to make sure that there's sustainable investment, how to open some of the doors that have been closed, and also how to talk with um, the communities and um, work with the committees to have their voices heard, not just within their communities, but across um, both the interface, but also to local council, um, to the Department for Communities uh, and wider afield. And so we uh, sort of threw ourselves in to um, doing, running all sorts of programs. So we had a homework club for the kids. We had an outdoor adventure program that actually explored the Fahan River, which is the river that runs um, right by both the states. And one of the things that we really talked about was that there is no physical shared space between the two areas. There is no place that both um, and there's nowhere that uh, community members from both places go naturally that they feel like is really um, a shared space nearby. And so we wanted to look at sort of the ecosystem as a whole um, and explore that. So we looked at uh, the Fahan, both members from both communities go fishing, um, members from both community communities walk um, their dogs or go for walks along the Fahan in different ways. And so we wanted to explore that with the young people. We went, we went on a series of um, trips from the source of the river all the way down to the mouth uh, as it enters the, the foil. Um, we ran well-being programs for adults, uh, arts and crafts programs for adults, as well as um, healthy cooking and some uh, physical activity programs as well. We had ongoing coffee mornings, um, and then we did trips with the young people as well, uh, bringing folks from both Curry Near and Tali Alley together. One of the ways in which we uh, worked the program was we had... Um, 
all of the activities existed in both of the centers. And so we were, um, we facilitated bringing community members from Tully Alley up to Curry Nearin's uh, community center and vice versa, um, community members from Curry Nearin down to Tully Alley's community center and began to, um, people really began to more comfortably uh, travel between the two areas. And I wouldn't, don't want to overstate it. Um, it definitely is not true for everybody. And there were definitely people who never did want to go um, and actually uh, enter the other, the other community's community center. But we did make some progress um, ar around that. Um, but there was also the reality under COVID, um, and this really in some ways surprised us, is that we created a new, uh, or we fell into, <laughs> we didn't really create it, we fell into a new shared space, which was a virtual shared space where we had uh, individuals who signed up for the yoga or for arts and crafts programs or other things that we did uh, virtually who maybe wouldn't have gone to the other person, the other um, communities, community center, but were very, very happy to socialize or very happy to uh, participate online uh, with, with members of the other community. So it wasn't so much the the, the human connection that was the problem, but actually the, the, the physical space. And so that was something that was really uh, interesting to learn. But also over the COVID uh, period, the last year of the Peace Four program, we had um, a variety of uh, programs such as sending out activity packs, um, but also working uh, a lot with some of the volunteers who really stepped up over the course of the year um, and uh, were delivering um, COVID packs to, you know, to, to their communities, making, knocking on doors, making sure everybody was okay. And sort of a whole layer of volunteers came out of the woodwork and really came together. And the community spirit in each of those areas um, was just um, amazing to see, uh, particularly folks who maybe hadn't been volunteering a lot before, but really found uh, an, an opportunity to, to, to come forward um, and to help their communities. And so seeing the ways in which people came together, I think, um, and the community spirit that came out of this feeling of needing to, to stand up for each other and, and help each other out um, has been something that we've been um, uh, continuing to to sort of foster uh, in, in these in this last year and then just so folks have a sort of a sense of of the scale of this of this project of the peace four project um, over these two communities together have about 600 households um, so it's a very relatively small um, two estates on, on the outskirts of dairy um, but over 500 people participated in at least one one program uh, or one event that we hosted because there weren't other programming in the areas um, we never turned people away so if people are familiar with the peace four projects you needed to have 26 contact hours over the course of uh, six months to to be considered a participant um so to speak and we had participants who um continue to come, whether it was throughout all the homework clubs or all the trips or, or things like that, um, and uh, participated in, in over 150 hours uh, because we never turned people away because there was so little programming um, through, through the centers anyways, because there was so little uh, additional funding, there was so little um, uh, sustainable funding uh, in the area. And, and because of this, there was a real collaboration between the committees and between certain individuals on the two committees in Curry Nier and in Tully Alley. Now, a lot of this was under the radar. And so this is not necessarily something we shouted from the rooftops, but Tully Alley has more sustainable funding. They, their um, worker and their programs are funded through uh, DFC. Um, and so every time Tully Alley brought in resource for themselves, they made sure that Curry Nearin had resource as well. So one thing that, um, for example, um, Tully Alley brought in Peace Bites um, into Tully Alley and ensured that Peace Bites also came to Curry Nearin as well. One summer when there was no worker in Curry Nearin, and it was a, a year where Curry Nearin didn't receive any funding from the local uh, council, and we're literally uh, going around door to door collecting money to turn turn the lights on in the community center. 
Taliali create um, uh, allowed for half of their spots in their summer scheme over the summer to be designated for Curry uh, uh community uh, children uh, community members as well. Um, this was ongoing. Uh, the committee uh, in Taliali, and particular individuals on the committee, were very very clear from the beginning that they wanted to do everything they could to advocate not only for themselves but also for for Curry Nearin. And, um, uh, as well. And there's a lot of other examples of um, Kari Niren uh, wanting to help in different ways, whether it was through volunteering. Um, some of the uh, some of the volunteers in Kari Niren uh, came down to Tully Alley to do certain um, in-kind <laughs> type uh, uh uh, volunteer work. So, for example, there were um, some some days where the, where Tully Alley needed a few people to um, clear out one of one of their rooms, and some folks from Kareneer and came down. And just more recently, Tully Alley got new chairs for their community center and shipped all of the cha- their old chairs up to Curry Niren um, because Curry Niren doesn't have the funding for for any chairs up there. And so that kind of collaboration, while um, maybe the whole community doesn't know about it, there is definite um, people working within the community who see both of these, see both Tali Ali and Curry Niren and see working together as key to to moving forward um, and advocating for each other. But sometimes it is a very public act of of solidarity and collaboration. So for example, we've done um, over the course of the peace program, as part of our advocacy for the areas um, and sort of rebuilding some of the relationships that we have, that the areas have had with statutory organizations and local government, is we brought uh, local politicians and um, some of the local um, statutory organizations for some walk arounds in both Karinir and Nintelli Alley, but also residents led those those walkthroughs as well to talk a little bit about what they want to see developed, what are some of their hopes, et cetera, uh, for for the areas. And there were community members in Taliali who were advocating for their for the for par- the park to be rebuilt um, and and funded in Kareniran, which is a I'll get to in a moment a big point of. Um, uh, anger in Karinir and that they've had a park that they've been campaigning for um, it to be uh, rebuilt for a very long time. It's an old park from the 1970s. So uh, community members from Tali Alley in a public forum were advocating for Karinir and, and vice versa. Folks from Karinir and were advocating that actually there needs to be more programming out of Tali Alley's community center and the, the pitches, um, which is one thing in Tali Alley that folks have talked about really wanting to have more investment in. They have um, taken members of the Curry and Niren, um, committee as well as residents have advocated for Tali Alley as well uh, publicly. And so that has been really wonderful to see. So what I'd like to do is show you a very quick, well, it's not the very quick, it's eight minutes, but a, a video of the work that we did in um, in Karinir and in Tali Alley at the Peace 4 project and get a sense of what Common Ground was about. And then just afterwards, um, I'll go through briefly what we're doing now, because obviously the Peace 4 program came to an end at the end of March. Um, and one of the things that was very clear is that we have a lot of work to still do um, in the areas. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, on the other side of this video. So. I'm the coordinator for the Common Ground Peace 4 project here in Karinir. Niren and Tully Alley, supported by SCUPB. And we have, um, over the past three years, done a huge amount of work in these two areas, run a variety of different programs for young people, for youth, as well as for older people. Everything from kickboxing programs, to trips away, to family day trips, to then supporting some of the fun days, as well as running programs like a cooking program, and a well-being program, arts and crafts programs, and things like that. One of the ones I thoroughly enjoyed, which myself and Natasha took part in together, was definitely the sea salts, the bath salt making, which we enjoyed doing in my mm. living room. Just a girly thing to do. The kickboxing was absolutely brilliant. It brought, so it brought a lot of young people uh, actually off the street and under the hall, kept doing the productive mm. stuff rather than out in the streets and stuff. 
My daughter, she really, really enjoyed doing the kickboxing, all the day trips, all the mixing with the different communities, doing homework clubs, stuff like that there. It was really, really good to get her out and get her active. The kids after schools club, they absolutely loved it. They really did. We did yoga in there. So it's like a Zoom that like we go on the call and then all of us meet up like all family and friends. I did the arts and craft too down in the centre, which I never thought I would be crafty, but I actually really enjoyed doing the crafts. <laughs> he loves to engage with Wonder Boxes, and he's only three, but he gets fun at it and has really enjoyed it from the start. And I think it's a very positive thing for our community. The main aim of the Common Ground Project was to bring people from both communities together um, in a way that helped them create friendships and develop bonds outside of what was happening before. So bring people together in ways that maybe they hadn't been brought before, use their own spaces in ways that hadn't been used before, maybe encourage a little bit more movement between the two estates, get people just to know each other a bit more in day-to-day -day level. Well, you can learn to mix with the community more, and we're learning, like, you know, we want each other's cultures as well. We're all coming together, and they're coming up to our centres, we're going down to their centres, and everyone's putting their own ideas in, and they come up around, and they're all helping all one as well. Well, we went and viewed and visited different areas, sat in a meeting, listened to their views and how they did everything to make their community group better looked at their different venues and looked at how we could improve ours. Mm -hmm. Just a joint force to looking for the future and improvements. Working with Toy Eye has been great. It's mad to think that they're just down the road and they're going through exactly the same thing we are. And we all want the same thing. We want a better communities and a better area. The positive things that come out of it was uh, that the young have learned to mix mm -hmm. and that uh, there's a lot going on with them that hasn't been going on this year. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very positive for outlook for the young people that there's more going on for them. Some of the best days were the family trips that we had. So we went to Lurgy Brack and we went to Port Stewart and the atmosphere was brilliant like and it was also a really relaxed way for people to get to meet each other so like uh we went up to lisburn to the water water slides and there were lots of people with very small babies and children that hadn't actually maybe met each other before but they lived really close together had children the same age and they were just chatting on the bus like i remember looking down the aisle and people just chatting over and back and handing babies over and back, which is just like, yeah, which is really lovely. These areas need a lot of uh, support. And that one of the things that is so clear is that there is a huge amount of goodwill between the two areas and there's ideas and ambition to work together to try to um, get as much resource into the area as possible. These are communities that have a very long history of working together. Um, and I think that that's something that needs supported and also needs um, amplified. What do I want to see for the future here? I want to see more stuff for the youths. I want more. I want new parks. I want new. I want our pavements fixed. I want new street lights. I want. I want. I just want for the youths. So I do, especially the next generation coming up, because there is nothing for them. I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> very passionate. I would like to see more things here for the children, definitely, things keeping up, keeping them active, having more cross-community things again, because again it stops any divide, it just gets everybody engaged. 4G pitch for the boys, because like, they keep travelling up to Drumahoe, going to the pitch and all, and so we always have to travel up to Drumahoe to do stuff, and it's not fairness. If we could get our park up and going which we've been trying fighting for the last 25 years. We never got one yet. So we'd love to get that up for the kids, for the this generation now, because we've been growing up and we haven't seen it. As you can see, the play park behind me is old and run down. The community here has been trying to organize to get a new play park for um, and campaign for it for, for many, many years. 
in a lot of the cross community work that we've done over the past three years, it's um, also clear that there's a lot of uh, desire from both Karineer and Talayali to work together in order to put forward proposals that bring in um, resources to both areas. And a play park is the thing that Karineer wants to see um, come to fruition. There's a lot of optimism that it's possible, um, and there's optimism that this is something that can can be won for the community within uh, the next few years. And so hopefully from the work that we've done on the Common Ground Project, working with Tele Alley, working with um, Dairy Strand District Council, working with um, Department for Communities, working with the Waterside Neighborhood Partnership, there's a real opportunity to, to work together to try to bring in the type of resource that's needed here. The community out here, the the community spirit, the volunteer, and everybody's a team. There's no there's nobody fighting against one another. Every everybody's just all in for together. We're all looking for the same outcome. I work along with the committee. I'm the secretary of the committee of the Tully Alley Community Centre. Through COVID nineteen, it's just been packed to the vulnerable. It's took a lot of lot of help from everybody in the community to do this. Look, I just love everything about Curry Near now because I get I just know everybody and everybody knows me. I would like to see these areas put on the map because I think they're ignored and um, overlooked an awful lot. I think that there's so much so many things that happen within the community that aren't seen because um, people are busy in their day-to-day -day lives but reaching out to their neighbours, and that's not something that you're going to see in a newspaper or on a TV programme, but it's happening all day, every day. The area is portrayed in a really negative way, and you only ever see the bad things. But when you take the time to walk around and talk to people and look at their houses, there's an awful lot of care. And there's an awful lot of care between houses and between streets and between people. Like, they're looking out for each other, they're making sure that they're okay. And I'd like to see more of that acknowledged. I would like to see fundamental resources available for people to, to be able to live their best lives. These are people who are working very hard day to day, looking after each other. They deserve to live somewhere that reflects that, that is that allows them to live dignified, fulfilled lives in a beautiful space. They're in the middle of fields. They deserve to have nice play parks, flower boxes, a beautiful place to sit, a lovely community center, all those things. That's what they deserve. And that's what I would like to see happening. So that's a sense of what the Common Ground Project was able to achieve. And one thing um, in the last nine months of the project that we really wanted to focus on was to ensure that when the Common Ground Project was over, that we weren't just leaving these areas with nothing sustainable in our place. And so one of the key things that we did in the last um, nine months was work with Department for Communities, uh, the local growth partnership and council to ensure that there was more responsibility being taken for these areas um, to ensure that these areas weren't going to just be neglected um, again. One thing that has been very frustrating for the committee, the community committees and for residents has been the start stop programming that comes in for your nine months, so to so to speak, and then March 31st rolls around, and there's a big gap uh, between whatever was the program last year and anything that that can come in for the, for the following year. And a real feeling of agencies coming in, being able to deliver something while their funding uh, exists, and then pulling back out again um, when their funding leaves, rather than having something really uh, sustainable in the areas. And so, um, because of that. Uh, St. Holmes Park House, uh, we were we were determined that we were going to, for um, at least the next wee while, 
um, apply for some for, for some further funding in order to try to um, have a bit of uh, the strategic work as well as some uh, very direct support for for the committees. So currently, I'm working on a project called Dare to Dream, which is supported uh, by CFNI. Um, and funded by um, uh, Esme Fairbairn and the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And it's an 18 month program in which the first nine months we're working with the community with actually a resident group from the community, some of the residents that you heard speaking um, in that video, um, in creating a community plan that aligns itself with the local growth plan, but also really spells out what are the key things we wanna see within the community. But this, this also, this project also has a participatory budgeting, a PB process uh, within it as well. And one of the things that the community um, has really articulated is a feeling of promises or being laid, uh, taken up the garden path, as 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 folks will say, and then not actually seeing um, any real wins. And so what we wanted to do is apply for a program that had real wins built into it. And so the PB process, the participatory budgeting process, the idea is to have some real wins that come from the community that they're able to see developed within the area. Um, and so that's something that we'll be taking forward as part of the Dare to Dream project. But another component of this project is also to continue to build those relationships um, and advocate for sustainable funding, to advocate for the Department for Communities to take Kareneer and back under its wing, to advocate for Dairy City and Strabandis Council, um, while there's planning for a uh, park uh, in in the works to actually see that follow through uh, in Curry Near and, and the pitches uh, redone in, in, in Tali Alley as well, um, as well as advocate for other funding um, and other opportunities as um, uh, within within those areas, um, we want to work with all the all of the statutory agencies to reconnect to to the areas, and that's been one of the difficulties when there haven't been workers in place um, in in either area is that there's been contact loss between the housing executive or contact loss between PSNI or the, the community wardens or what have you, and so trying to rebuild those relationships has been really key to Dare to Dream, so that these communities are back part of the part of the fabric of uh, the water side, but also um, are moved up, so to speak, um, in, in the list of, of areas to, to see some improvements uh, improvements on because it's so desperately needed. St. Holmes Park House also applied to uh, TEO Central um, Good Relations in order to support uh, the Kari Niren and Tali Alley community uh, committees both in terms of their training, but also there have been a lot of volunteers that stepped up over the past year through the COVID uh, pandemic, and neither center um, really had a volunteer management structure. And so as part of that application and project, we're going um, to um, have a, a volunteer support system that includes training up um, of local residents. Um, in the last year, um, through the support of Belfast Interface Project, a series of six local residents um, received their um, their youth work um, OCN level two. And so we wanted to carry them through to level three so they can be volunteering and possibly getting part-time work um, when the centers are open as they are currently for youth clubs, et cetera. So part of skilling up the area uh, and residents within the area to take a more um, active role um, in, in the community has been a key thing that we have been working on. And then finally, St. Holmes Park House is uh, lucky to also be able to um, get some funding from the NIO in order to support Carnier and particularly um, uh, in a community safety and youth project uh, in order for there to be an actual part-time worker on the ground who's able to um, to you know run some of the youth programming that's that's in the that's in the center as well. Th these are not um, solutions. These are band-aids. Um, I think for the next um, nine to 18 months in the area. And so there's, a I think, a real onus on um, the statutory organizations and local government for their duty of care to these areas. And we will continue to pressure and advocate and lobby all we can for these areas because at the end of the day, um, the uh, feeling of neglect is based in reality. Um, and in order for us to 
um, really make progress towards um, peace and towards more collaboration and more um, sort of solidarity, so to speak, across the interface. We know that for these areas need to be strong, they need to be vibrant, they need the residents there need to feel dignified, they need to feel respected listened to and heard. Um, and so there's greater policy issues in terms of tackling poverty, tackling mental health issues that obviously um, our program is not going to solve uh, overnight, but hope, but I think that we all have a role in advocating um, uh, for, for those areas in or every uh, deprived area and making sure that the policies um, are you know, across uh, government are are ones that are benefiting and lifting up um, these the these communities. Um, but also, you know, we want to make sure that doors continue to be opened um, and communities feel like they have a, a future and have hope in the future. Um, and that's the the energy and I think some of the excitement um, that we want to harness coming out of the Common Ground Project and into the the future in these two areas. Fascinating insight into what this work means on, on, on the ground. Three very clear themes coming through there for, for me. Firstly, once again, the importance of, of community empowerment. Secondly, the synergy. I think when, when two communities come together and take control of the agenda and, and the sum uh, really is much more, the, 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 the whole really is much more than the sum of the parts when that happens. And thirdly, I think that very clear message of the, the importance of commitment from us in, in the statutory sector, uh, the importance of ongoing and sustained investment uh, in, in communities and, and showing that we have faith in them uh, to deliver uh, when they, we empower them to do so. Uh, very clear messages there. 